The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. I'm in fantasy land. I got up at 3.45 this morning in Austin, Texas, which was 1.45, your time, and I've been, I just got here. There was a big delay in San Francisco of about five hours or four hours or so. So I'm kind of reeling here, but thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. What I'm going to be doing is uh, talking to you for about uh, 50 minutes or 45 minutes, somewhere in there and then spend the rest of my time with you responding to whatever questions you may have or comments you may have. For me, the latter part is much more interesting. I know what I think about the world, and you know, I'll say it, but I'd rather respond to what you think about the world and what I have to say. I'm going to begin uh, not with any abstract lecturing thing. I'm going to start instead with a little anecdote that I hope is germane to the topic here, which is after the war, that that's what I'll be talking about, what happens when a war is over. In fact, do wars ever end? I'll come to that too. My answer to that is no. About two years ago, I received a letter from a 26-year-old woman uh, in, living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, my home, my home state. Uh, she was an elementary school teacher, <clears throat> and the letter began, Dear Mr. O'Brien, I've been wanting to write to you now for a long, long time, but now I feel I have to. She, uh, this is, a, I'm going to paraphrase what is really a long letter, probably 40-page letter written on both sides, so 80 pages. On page one and part of page two, she said, uh, I grew up in a household that was a nightmare. My, uh, I hated going to dinner at night because it was so full of tension and, and a submerged anger on the part of my father who would sit at the dinner table and stare at his plate and eat his meatloaf and not talk at all. She said as a seven and eight year old kid, she was terrified when her mom said, time for dinner. She couldn't, she said, I just hated going to that table. And I hated sitting there for 45 minutes, looking at my dad, the cords in my father's neck tense up and his face go flushed. She said by the time she had reached uh, early junior high school or middle school, uh, she hated even being in her house and because of the tension in that house. She had no idea where it was coming from and what was the cause of it all. One day when she was in ninth grade, she went down into the basement of her house, she said in her letter to me, and under a cot she found a small box, cardboard box, opened it up and in the box she found relics of her father's history, or artifacts of her father's history. She found some medals from Vietnam, a little small stack of, of uh, snapshots of soldiers, her father among them. She found a triangular garment that was part of a stripper's costume that had come off some stripper who had come through Vietnam from the Philippines weird little odds and ends of her father's history. She said as a ninth grader, she understood at that moment when she looked into that box that her father had once been a soldier. 
And she said in her letter, she also kind of assumed, although she was young and didn't know much about the world, but kind of assumed that the tension at that dinner table had something to do with that box under the cot down in the basement. She said by the time she'd reached her early high school years, I'm about, I'm paraphrasing a lot, I'm about a third of the way into her letter now. By the time she reached uh, high school, she was a sophomore in an early years of her, early months of her junior year in high school, <clears throat> she felt more like a counselor than a daughter, trying to keep her parents uh, sane and operative in our world. She said at one point her mother took her aside and said, you know, I've never loved your father. And the girl said, never? Why did you marry him? And her mother said, I married him out of pity. They had gone out on dates in college, and her father had gone to Vietnam and came home a different human being, not the fun-loving guy that she had gone to see Bonnie and Clyde with and on these dates. She said, how can you love somebody who never talks? You've seen your dad sitting at that table night after night, year after year, staring at his plate, never saying a word about anything. Certainly not the war, but about anything. About two-thirds of the way through the letter, this now 26-year-old woman said that in her senior year in high school, in an AP English class, she was assigned the things they carried, my book. She brought it home, and she left it on a coffee table, not intentionally, just left it there after finishing it. Her dad picked it up and began reading, not a lot, just, uh, you know, 20, 30 pages, just a little bit of it. And then her mom called people to dinner. And at the dinner table that night, her dad started talking, not a lot, but a few things here and there, quibbling with the book, oh, I carry this, and he forgot to mention that, and um, I, uh, this was in my pocket, and O'Brien didn't mention it. And then the next night, he read more of the book, and then more. And each night, he would have more to say about his own life and his own history, which got the mother talking about those college years I mentioned to you and how different he was before going off to that war, what a different man he was. Near the end of the letter, the woman said to me, I don't know why exactly I'm writing to you. My parents aren't perfect, even now, but they're still together. And I don't think they would have been if that book hadn't been lying on that coffee table that afternoon before supper. She ended her letter by saying, I guess all I really want to say is thanks took me 80 pages to do it, <laughs> but thanks. Well, I start with that anecdote for a whole bunch of reasons. First one is that I'm a, I'm a storyteller, and I'm comfortable with things like that, telling anecdotes and stories about our, our world. And I told it partly just to kind of warm myself up. Uh, as a storyteller, I'm suspicious of abstraction and generalizations about this world we all live in. For everything I can generalize about, I always come up with some exception. Um, and I'm suspicious of it. I trust instead the power of story uh, to, through the osmosis that happens through storytelling, to carry whatever message I may have. And I have very few messages. 
Uh, my intent when I'm writing my stories or telling them as I just did is to make you feel something that you may not have felt otherwise. When we discuss issues about veterans and readjustment and all that, there's an abstract, cold, analytical quality to it. And it's hard to feel much because of the abstraction. And I thought through that story, which in a couple of places made me tear up, choke up, even though it's not my story, it's her story. Stories can do that. They can make us feel things that we may not have felt before and look at the world, therefore, in a new kind of way. The second reason I began with this little anecdote has to do with this theme that I'm talking about today, after the war. What I just told you was not a war story. It was an after the war story. It was not a story with any bloodshed in it. Nobody was shot, nobody was bombed, nobody was napalm, nobody was wounded, nobody lost their legs. It was worse than all that. It was a story of a family suffering years and years and years after the end of a war. A little girl suffering, terrified of going to a dinner table. Wars do not end when you sign peace treaties. Wars do not end when the hostilities cease. They go on and on in memory. And not just the memories of those who participated in the wars, the soldiers, but they go on and on in the lives of the wives and the girlfriends and the daughters and the sons and the grandsons and the granddaughters and those who went through war, just as that girl who became later a woman suffered the consequences of a war in a visceral way, hating to go to that dinner table. One of the consequences of war, like the father in that story, is silence. After trauma, there's a tendency to fall silent. And I want to talk about some of the sources of that silence. It may surprise you a little bit. I'm not here as a lecturer. I'm here as somebody who lived through it myself, as a combat veteran of Vietnam who returned home and fell silent. And I'm still silent, largely, unless I have to do things like this or when I'm talking through my books. Part of it is psychological. Everybody wants to build a kind of carapace or a shell to kind of insist and hold in the hurt and the anguish of it all. But the silences are caused not just by that. That's sort of the standard reason we all think of. Many veterans, myself included, fall silent out of simple politeness. Just to be polite. You don't walk into a cocktail party and say, hey, you want to hear about Nam? <laughs> Imagine the, the answer is no. You can see it in their eyeball. They don't. They want to have a gin and tonic and have some fun. Out of politeness, you don't grab people by the lapels and start lecturing them about, you know, things like combat and war and so on. And we have to recognize that as part of the dynamic that causes us the great intense silences of that man at that dinner table. Another cause of silence is it's so difficult to know where to stop and where to start and what to tell, what to select. Out of even just one year in combat, there are so many experiences and so many things witnessed by your eyeballs and by your ears and by your heart and by your soul that you don't know what to say, even if someone were to ask you, what was the war like? What did you, ex what did you experience? You're struck dumb. You're struck mute by the overwhelming amount of stuff that you've accumulated during that year. Do you tell that story or that story? Do you tell a story of heroism or a story of the nasty pettiness of war? On top of that, chronologies get scrambled in memory. I mean, if I were to ask you about, tell me what happened to you yesterday in order, in chronology, you're going to have a hard time doing it because most of yesterday is erased. We all erase our lives as we live them, don't we? You don't remember every scab you picked and every dish you washed and every line of dialogue you uttered throughout a day. It's a, it, you lose it. Even yesterday for you is lost. 
And imagine what happens in a war when, the, when so much is going on all around you and you're in mortal terror. Imagine what you're erasing just through the natural consequences of being a human being. Hence, when you're asked, what was a war like? And what did you bring home from it? And what did you learn? And what are your troubles? You can't remember. You're struck dumb by your own forgetfulness. On top of that, how do you capture in language the surreal, this can't be happening feel of combat? How do you find words that capture the blood pulsing out of an ear from somebody who is dying and who is uttering at the same time that the blood is gushing out of his ear, mama, 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 mama. How do you do it? Well, you kind of did it, do it the way I just did, but that doesn't have a surreal feel. It's too, too easy because on top of the visual stuff, there's what's happening inside your own heart as a person witnessing that. You're thinking not just thoughts of horror. You're thinking, thank God that's not me. Thank God I'm not the person with gut, blood coming out of my ear. Thank God I'm not the person saying, mama, mama, mama. And then you're thinking as you hear those words, mama, about your own mother as you're watching this person die. So there's a surreal Alice in Wonderland feel that, uh, to, to combat that's not unlike what might happen, say, if you were in a breast, had, you know, had breast cancer or in a hospital and doctors all around you and you've been horribly disfigured. There's a surreal quality to that as well, so my sister has told me. On top of that, I'm trying to give some sort of layers of what causes this, this syndrome of silence, the inability to utter much about a war. On top of that, there's another layer, which has to do with the notion of truth. When, you go, when you're asked, what was a war like, the expectation is you're going to tell the truth. The difficulty is, is that you lose a sense through having been in combat, a sense of truth. Of what is true? For example, I was brought up a Methodist in my hometown of Worthington, Minnesota. And on Sunday, the minister would say, thou shalt not kill. And as a nice little boy, I took it literally. And then found myself eight, nine years later being told, you'd better kill or we'll court-martial your ass. My country telling me that. Well, who's right and who's wrong? Is the minister right? And if he is right, and if you're a, you know, a fundamentalist, uh, what, what the hell are you going off killing people for? Unless it's not a commandment. It's called one of the Ten Commandments. But it must not be a commandment if your country and the same people are telling you, yeah, go kill people. It's okay in these circumstances. That's an example of where truths are contradictory. And you learn it the hard way in a war. You learn it that what is true in Worthington, Minnesota, may not be true in a place like Quang Nai Province, Vietnam, or in Kabul, Afghanistan, Benghazi, Libya. What is true one place may not be another. On top of that, there's this common notion of what's true floating around in this world of ours. It's sort of a commonsensical notion of what's true, as if there are little bits of truth that float by, and you can grab them and say, that's true. The difficulty with that is that truths change. They evolve. They're fluid. I am not any longer the person I was back in 1967 a college student, because in 1968, I ended up in Vietnam and became a different person. I evolved. The person who I want, that was once Tim O'Brien is gone, and there's a new person, same name, same shell, same body, but a different person inside of that. It's happened to you as well. You're not the same person you were when you were eight years old or nine, I hope, are you? <laughs> We all change. I had, this, I had this girlfriend back in high school, her name was Trish, and she would, uh, girlfriends are wrong, I had like three dates with her, 
But she would say things like, you know, oh, man, I really love you. You're great. And the next night, you're a creep. And then you're great, and you're a creep. She was never lying. She was changing your not mind constantly. We all change our minds about lots of stuff. You know, whether you like broccoli, two years later, after you're, when you're 12 years old, you might like it. Truths change. They evolve. Ask Columbus. Ask Newton. Ask Einstein. What's true once is not true you know, five years later. On top of that, what's true, say, in Austin, Texas, is not true in, uh, you know, Santa Barbara, California. So if, just in the sense of time, you know, you look at your watch and you say it's now 4.30 in Austin. Well, it's not true here, is it? And it's not true on Neptune, is it? So what's true one place is not true another. I'm trying to talk about the whole compli the complications of knowing what is true and fixed and worth the saying, worth the utterance, and what makes us fall silent. Um, I want to read, uh, I told uh, Susan that I was going to read a couple of little, quick little sections from some of my work to kind of illustrate uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at in this whole issue of, of staying silent. And this has to do with this issue of truth, how hard it is to tell the truth about anything when you come home from a war because you're not sure what it is. In a true war story, if there's a moral at all, it's like the thread that makes the cloth. You can't tease it out. You can't extract the meaning without unraveling the deeper meaning. And in the end, really, there's nothing, nothing much to say about a true war story except maybe, oh. True war stories do not generalize. They do not indulge in abstraction or analysis. For example, war is hell. As a moral declaration, the old truism seems perfectly true. And yet, because it abstracts, because it generalizes, I can't believe it with my stomach. Nothing turns inside. It comes down to gut instinct. A true war story, if truly told, makes the stomach believe. Part of that's why I became a fiction writer, that nonfiction appeals to the intellect, to the rationality, but stories appeal to something else, to your stomach and to your heart and to your adenoids and to your tear ducts and to the nape of your neck. A story goes at the whole human being and not just at the head. This story does it for me. I've told it before, many times, many versions. But here's what actually happened. We crossed that river and marched west into the mountains. On the third day, Kurt Lemon stepped on a booby-trapped artillery round. He was playing catch with Rat Kiley, laughing, and then he was dead. The trees were thick. It took nearly an hour to cut a LZ for the dust off. And then later, higher in the mountains, we came across a baby VC water buffalo. What it was doing there, I don't know. No farms, no paddies. But we chased it down and got a rope around it and led it along to a deserted village where we set up for the night. After supper, Rat Kylie went over and stroked the nose of that baby water buffalo. He opened up a can of sea rations, pork and beans, but the baby buffalo wasn't interested. Rat Kylie shrugged. He stepped back and shot it through the right front knee. The animal did not make a sound. It went down hard and got up again, and Rat took careful aim and shot off an ear. He shot it in the hindquarters and in the little hump at its back. He shot it twice in the flanks. It wasn't to kill. It was to hurt. He put the rifle muzzle up against the mouth and shot the mouth away. Nobody said much. The whole platoon stood there watching, feeling all kinds of things. 
but there was not a great deal of pity for that baby water buffalo. Our friend Kurt Lemon was dead. Rat Kiley had lost his best friend in the world. Later in the week, Rat would write a long personal letter to the guy's sister, who would not write back. But for now, for Rat, it was just a question of pain. He shot off the tail. He shot away chunks of meat below the ribs. All around us, there was the smell of smoke and filth and deep greenery. And the evening was humid and very hot. And Rat Kylie went to automatic. He shot randomly, almost casually, quick little spurts in the belly and butt. Then he reloaded, squatted down, and shot the baby buffalo in the left front knee. Again, the animal fell hard and tried to get up. But this time, it couldn't quite make it. It wobbled and went down sideways. Rat shot it in the nose. He bent forward and whispered something, as if talking to a pet. And then he shot it in the throat. All the while, the baby water buffalo was silent, or almost silent, just a light bubbling sound where the nose had been. It lay very still. Nothing moved except the eyes, which were enormous, the pupils shiny black and dumb. Rat Kylie was crying. He tried to say something, but then he cradled his weapon and went off by himself. The rest of us stood in a ragged circle around that baby water buffalo. For a long time, no one spoke. We had witnessed something essential, something brand new and profound, a piece of the world so startling there was not yet a name for it. Somebody kicked the baby buffalo. It was still alive, though just barely just in the eyes. Amazing, Dave Jensen said. My whole life, man, I never seen anything like it. Amazing. Kiowa and Mitchell Sanders picked up the baby buffalo. They hauled it across the open village square, hoisted it up, and dumped it in the village well. Afterward, we sat waiting for Rat to get himself together. Amazing, Dave Jensen kept saying. A new wrinkle, man. I've never seen it before. My friend Mitchell Sanders took out his yo-yo. Well, that's Nam, he said. Garden of evil. Over here, man, every sin's real fresh and original. Why do I choose that little passage deal? I thought it illustrated a whole bunch of what I tried to talk about earlier, the abstract part, through a story, as opposed to abstraction, the surreal quality, the petty nastiness of war, the swirly nature of what's true, not just about political issues of war and peace, but what's true in the end about yourself. Rat Kiley was a nice guy. His best friend in the world had been killed about two hours before this incident. He was a gentle, lovely person. And yet became somebody different. A person he'll have to bear with him, and I'm sure has been bearing with him now for 40 years since this little episode. Another reason for silence, and maybe the capping, icing on the cake reason, has to do with our standard American narrative of what war is. 
Americans always the good guys. Americans always with the white hats. Americans always are galloping off to the rescue of the beleaguered and the needy and the oppressed. A Fourth of July story, a Veterans Day story, a heroic narrative. The difficulty again is that war just is not that way. Even Americans, such as Rat Kiley, and such as the person you're looking at right now, committed the most atrocious and evil and nasty deeds in the course of a war. A war fought for reasons of great rectitude, at least according to the politicians. But in the war, there was a petty, daily, second by second, moment by moment, nastiness to it all. It was like being immersed in crankcase oil. Evil, of the most tactile sort. You could feel it inside you, down and going down into your belly and through your thoughts and through your dreams. A horror that was informed partly by the violence all around you, but mostly by the, per the changes in your own personality. And as you stepped off that plane in Vietnam and went through a year of combat, changes partly of being callous to it all, but also having doors open that you thought weren't even there to open, the doors of savagery and doors of brutality that you thought you were incapable of as a nice little kid growing up in southern Minnesota. I wanted to say a few things. I'm, I, there's so much to say, and I I'm, I'm, I'm just feel like I'm just barely brushing the dust off of the topic that I'm trying to address here. But I had uh, told Susan I was going to talk a little bit about the similarities between what I went through 40-some uh, years ago and what our modern-day veterans have gone through in their wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I think they're plenty. There is, however, a huge difference between what I had gone through and what soldiers are going through today, which, of course, is the absence of a draft. There is none today. And it's big. In Las Vegas, they have this expression, skin in the game, which means that you, you, you can watch people play blackjack, and it doesn't mean much because you have no skin in the game. You don't, it's not your money on the table. You're not losing anything. And because of the absence of a draft, whole families are just immune. You don't have to go to a war unless you want to, unless your son signs up or your daughter. Uh, you're in... As a result, it's easy to become apathetic to it all, just blank it all out, forget there's even a war in progress. Um, I would venture to say that during the course of today, this day, here in Santa Barbara, very few of you thought, oh, goodness, there's a war on, people are dying and killing. I don't think that crossed your minds. But I bet it would have crossed your minds if your brother were there or your father were there. In fact, I would have bet it would have crossed your minds a lot, as it did my parents' minds when I uh, spent my year in Vietnam. On top of that, when you don't have skin in the game, when the wolf is not at your door, it's easy to go bellicose and belligerent in your rhetoric. It's so easy to do. Because you don't have any skin in the game. What's to lose? Let's go kill communists. Let's go kill the Taliban. A little harder to do if it's your kid going off to kill uh, the so-called enemy, or better yet, you. Well, is there a lesson in this? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I'm not big on lessons. But I did come home from Vietnam, as I bet a whole bunch of soldiers have come home from Afghanistan and Iraq, saying, this is a free country. You know, you're free to speak our minds, to support wars. But if you're for a war, Go. Go. What the hell are you sitting in college for? Go if you're for, or do you want somebody else to do the killing for you? Is that what you want? And the dying for you, is that what you want? Well, back in Minnesota, we had a word for that, and that word was called hypocrisy. That's the word for it. 
You can say, oh, God, it's not practical. You know, I got a job. How practical was it to send me? I had a full-ride scholarship to Harvard. I didn't want to go kill people or die. It wasn't very practical. Is it more practical to go sell, send 19-year-old kids to die instead of, say, 45-year-old people? If you're for a war, go. Even if you're, say, 90, go. Take an apartment in Baghdad. Just walk the streets. See how you like going to the bazaar with you know, suicide bombers all around you. Put your blood where your mouth is. Put your body where your rhetoric is. Go! Otherwise, I'm going to think of you forever as a hypocrite because you are one. Well, is there a lesson in that? No. But there is the outrage you heard in my voice. And that is a similarity. Yeah, there's no draft. Big difference. But when soldiers come home from a war and hear hypocrisy all around them, uh, that is a similarity that I think all the veterans in this room share. And I know there are a bunch of them here. Another similarity between then and now is this. We're engaged uh, right now in civil wars, you know, which means no uniforms, no front, no rear, no up, no down. No knowledge of who's the enemy. You, you don't know who your enemy is. It's not like a John Wayne movie where they're all dressed up in, you know, good Hollywood costumes and they're, they're, the, they're the German helmets. You don't know who to sh who, who, whom to shoot at. You don't know whom to kill unless they start shooting at you. And then you know, but it's always too late. Well, when you're embroiled in a situation like that, like, who's the enemy? Physiological and psychological things begin to happen to you. You get tight. Who, 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 you're looking behind you, and there's no front, there's no rear. You don't know if that little boy is your friend or your enemy. You have no idea. And if you're 18 or 19 years old and you're carrying around all this weaponry, uh, that tension is going to find an outlet, as it did for us in Vietnam. We would take sniper fire from a village, and we were so paralyzed and so tight about whom to, who, where was the enemy, that that village would just fry. You know, a couple of sniper rounds, and yeah, you could hear the donkeys dying and the chickens and the old ladies screaming in that village. There might have been a dead Viet Cong soldier at the end of this, too. But that was the consequence of this tight feeling. Another similarity is that is just the, the technology. In Vietnam, we had these things called landmines. Today, they're called IEDs, improvised explosive devices. In my unit in Quang Nai province, roughly 85% of our casualties came from landmines, maybe 90% of all sorts, little things called toe poppers that would blow off a foot, larger things called bouncing beddies. You'd step on it, and a charge would send the mine up into the air about two feet, and it would explode blow you away, all the way up to rigged artillery rounds, you know, booby-trapped artillery rounds that would blow away a whole platoon or squad. Um, and today, of course, that's one of the primary sources of the casualties coming out of uh, our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, how do you shoot back at a landmine? It's dead. You can't kill it. It's inanimate. It's made out of plastic, some metal, explosives, and that's it. It is dead, and you can't fight back against it, and yet it's killing you. Well, again, psychologically, things happen, and physiologically, too. As we walk through day after day in Vietnam, you get almost a permanent calcified arc to your spine as you look down at the earth, trying to look for these things, which are impossible to find. They'd find you again. You didn't find them. Um, once one goes off and there's some guy without a leg or arms or a life lying there mutilated on the ground, you're full, naturally full, not just of sorrow, but of rage, the kind of rage that Rat Kylie felt as he was shooting that baby water buffalo. Something to strike back at. You can't find the enemy, so strike back at whatever presents itself whether it's a village or an old man or a water buffalo, something to strike back at. Another similarity is between what's going on now and what went on all those years ago is this. 
A bullet can kill the enemy, that's for sure. But a bullet can also manufacture an enemy, and that's for sure. If that bullet strikes a six-year-old kid in the head, you have got one pissed-off mother and father and brother and sister and neighbor and best friend and uncle and aunt. Just do the multiplication. And it has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with Taliban and 9-11. It has to do with well, how you would feel if your kid were shot in the head, whether by accident or intent. Either way, it doesn't matter. You've got a dead kid on your hands. How are you going to respond in your heart and in your actions? Are you going to be, oh, man, I'm all for these guys. Let's really support them. Of course you're not. Bullets and violence in general can have the consequences intended. That is, you can kill the enemy. You can destroy their will to fight, all that sort of thing. But the, you have to bear in mind at the same time a contradictory truth, which is that bullets and violence can manufacture an enemy. And I, re I recommend that we all bear that in mind as we make our decisions. About, it doesn't mean you don't support wars or you do, but in the calculus of your decision, you've got to bear it in mind as veterans will automatically do because they've been through it and they know. I want to tell a little anecdote again. I'm getting preachy and I want to move away from the preachyism and kind of conclude before I take your questions with one little anecdote that I hope summarizes a whole bunch of what I had to say here but doesn't summarize it in an abstract sense. It was July 1969, hot day way up in the, the high 90s. My platoon had taken two casualties that morning. One guy dead, one guy badly wounded. By badly wounded, I mean no legs. And at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we walked into a small, smoky, spooky little village, very near where the My Lai Massacre had happened uh, about... 14 months earlier. Soon after entering this little village, a resupply helicopter arrived. It brought in a load of ammunition and smoke grenades and hand grenades and all this sort of thing. But it also brought these, the gift of these three big canvas bags filled with iced soda pop and beer and uh, little cartons of milk. At the center of the village, there was a well, and so we opened up the soda pop and the milk and the beer, and we were drinking the stuff, and at, at the well stood a, a, an old man. By old, I don't, I, it was, I was so young, old felt like 32 or something, but this guy was yeah, somewhere in his 80s, I would guess. Uh, he wore no shirt, no shoes, you know, barefoot, just a pair of kind of, uh, of, we called them pajamas that the peasants would wear. The guy probably weighed 80, 90 pounds. Very skinny man. You could see this, the ribs jutting out of his, you know, like, a, like some sunken galleon at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, the man was totally blind. He, his eyes looked like aluminum discs that the sun would reflect off them, this kind of cauterized, burnt-out aluminum. He stood at the well, and for, the net, for, the, for a half hour or so, he gave us showers. These soldiers lined up with their beer and soda pop and milk. And we stood in a line, and we'd walk by the old man, and he'd dip his bucket into the well and bring it up and slosh the water over our shoulders and backs and bellies. At one point, one of my fellow soldiers, a kid named Tom, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed son of my home state of Minnesota, big, beefy kid, approached the old man. And from three feet away, threw a 
carton of this milk at the old man as hard as he could at his face. A full carton of the milk. Hit the old guy in the eye. Remember, he was blind. He had no idea what had happened to him. He lost his balance. He fell into the dirt and dust beside the well. Um, after, at, at the, while the old man was giving us these showers, the, the village kids were around us. They were kind of giggling and laughing at our, you know, mostly naked bodies. And it was almost happy in that village, but I wasn't happy anymore. The whole place went dead silent. Not just the kids, not just the Vietnamese, but my fellow soldiers and myself as well. We just it went silent. And you could hear the silence the way if I were to stop talking now, the way you'd hear silence in this room. There it is. After a while, the old guy pushed to his feet. His tongue went out and kind of licked at the milk that had splashed across his face. There was a little trickle of blood coming down his eye. And then he found his bucket by sort of feeling around for it and picked it up and dunked it in the well and brought up some more water and showered the next soldier. Why do I conclude with this little story? Well, for a whole bunch of reasons. One is, is that it's an example of how war stories are not just about war. This is not a battle. This is not gunfire and bombs dropping. This is a carton of milk striking an old man in the face. Uh, its own little atrocity, not the kind you're going to read about in headlines, but part of that daily, nasty, second-by-second second feel of what war is. It's not just the stuff you expect. It's cartons of milk as well. The second reason I tell you about it is that silence. I dream about that old man to this day as much as I dream about anything from that period. And what I dream about is partly the imagery of the milk down that blind man's face. But more than that, what I'm dreaming about is my own culpability in it all, because I fell silent. I will never know why exactly this kid Tom did what he did. I don't know. I can kind of guess. He was pissed off. It would have been a tough day. A dead man and a man with no legs. His age, he was a young guy, you know, probably 18 years old. He wasn't Mr. Mature. He'd seen one too many horrors and something broke and he took it out on what presented itself which in this case was a blind old man but my sense of recrimination is not directed at Tom it's really in the end directed at myself because I didn't say anything I didn't speak up as I would have back in Worthington Minnesota and say you can't do that that what I you know I didn't get all over him I felt si I felt silent and I fell silent because I had become a nerd to it all, too. My shell had gotten hard. I had witnessed one too many bad things as well. And the silence, my own silence, sticks with me deep in my stomach to this day. It'll never go away. And it's among the things I will always carry uh, from my service in that war. Now, I'm gonna, I've, I've gone on long enough. I'm going to stop now and spend a little time responding to whatever questions you may have, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Hello. Hey, Hi. how's it going, Tim? Good. My name's Aaron. I'm one of the student veterans on campus. 
Is this, can you guys hear me? Is this working? Okay, cool. talk a little louder, I think. What's going on? My name's Aaron. I'm one of the student veterans on campus. Okay. I was a Green Beret with the first Special Forces group. And every single combat deployment I went on, um, keeping in theme with your talk about silence, I would adopt a form of like emotional numbness that would allow me to just deal with the environment I was in and how desperate I felt. And that stayed with me through every single trip I was on and wouldn't just turn off when I got home. So about this time last year, I had just gotten back from Afghanistan and I was trying to put my thoughts together between transitioning between the different envir environments and like you're saying, how surreal it feels. Mm -hmm. And I was in a cafe in downtown Seattle by myself thinking about like, you know, what I, w what I was involved in, you know, just a few days prior. And just being in a completely new environment that was exposing me to social and emotional feelings that I had completely turned off um, forced me to just like start weeping to myself. And that's kind of when I knew that I was home, but I wasn't sure what it meant yet. And I was curious if there was a, a moment you had upon returning home from Vietnam that's like the most salient for you as to like, I identify I so now. much with that story you just told. I mean, that's, you sound like you're me, except you look a little younger. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, well, my moment also happened in Seattle. This is very weird. I uh, returned from Vietnam, and we landed in uh, Seattle. It was at Fort Lewis, you know, at uh, McCord Air Force Base near Fort Lewis. And uh, there was a big sign that, after a year of nightmare stuff, that said, welcome home returnees, which is a word that only the Army would ever use, like returnee. I don't think it's even a word. Maybe it is, but it's certainly, if there is, it is a word, it's a military word. They gave us uh, steak dinners, kind of leathery steak, and then we, we, spent, we spent the next uh, 13 hours processing our way out of the Army, getting haircuts and signing papers, and uh, I remember saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and the war was over. That quickly, that disjunction, just as you were thinking, not that long ago I was doing this, and now I'm eating a steak dinner with a sign that says, Welcome Home Returnees, and I'm saying the Pledge of Allegiance, which is like third grade sort of thing. I got on, a, we went out, I thought the war, I was out of the army. I uh, still had my uniform on, and I got on another plane and headed for Minnesota. It was about uh, six or seven in the morning. We took off, and we left Seattle and flew out over Montana and North Dakota. It was March, and I remember looking down and saying, seeing the cornfields and the snow down below. I remember going into the back of the airplane and to the bathroom and taking off my uniform and putting on that hat and sweater, blue jeans, and then landing in Minneapolis. And the disjunction, no one, no one would know, just as if I were to see you on the street, I would never know you had been a Green Beret or in a war. There's no way of knowing without the paraphernalia of it all. And it's as if you're living two lives. There's a life of what had been, the memories, and there's a life you have now, which is trying to comport yourself with some dignity through the rest of your life uh, and making something of it all. But the, the, that, that's an example of your story and mine, which are so similar, of the, that surreal thing I was talking about. It's very hard to... Uh, described to people because of how abrupt the change is. My dad had come home from the Pacific in World War II on a troop ship. And it was long. It was months before he got home from his war. And I was home in 18 hours. One moment in combat and then a shower, get on a plane, and, you know, 18 hours later, I'm back in Minneapolis. I mean, what? That's the wonderland feel, and I think that example can make you sort of at least feel a little bit of what, that, what it's like. 
Good question. Hi. Hi. Okay, my name's Emily, and I'm currently doing a research project on, like, children of Holocaust survivors, and I mm -hmm. noticed you kept saying a phrase that they often say, and they often say that, like, it's never truly over. So I was wondering if you had, like, any idea of how you think your kids will deal with this in the future? Because they still I seem don't pretty know. young. I'm, I'm thinking of chaining them to the bed. <laughs> 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 the, uh, it, you know, that's one of the things that I didn't want to be a parent. I fought it for a while. That's why I'm so old, and I've got two little kids now. I've got a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. But you'll have to, you, have to see, you have to give up control of your kids. You can't live their lives for them any more than my parents could live mine. Um, I try to tell them stories, the same thing I do here, that I, you can't preach to children or to adults. You know, it's just not going to work. But stories, they can seep into your memory. That water buffalo getting shot and shot and shot and shot and shot and shot and shot. Not to kill it, but to hurt it. Is there a point? Well, no, there's a whole bunch of points to it all. It's to feel what war does to people and um, not uh, uh, that's what I do with my children I tell them stories I do just sprinkle a little Ajax on them to clean them up a little bit but not too much uh, just enough so my wife won't get mad at me but uh, I try to make them as real as I can I of course don't just tell war stories I tell all kinds of stories but they're always stories about human beings making choices about what you're going to do in, with your life and in the world. Are you going to do, you can have the courage to step in and do the right thing as I should have that day with that old man at the well. I should have stepped in and done something. And uh, the, the stories are about that sort of thing and that's what I do. I tell my kids stories. Hi. Hello. Hi. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. So my question is uh, about the book, The Things I Carried. Uh, I asked this question. I asked this question to my uh, teacher uh, in AP Lit, and she said she couldn't answer it. So I'm hoping you can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's in the section uh, called A True War Story, and it's when Mitchell Sanders is speaking to the character Tim O'Brien. And he tells him of a story where six men were off in the woods and they were patrolling or just watching or I'm not sure exactly. Listening post. Listening, okay. And they started hearing voices and it was weird voices, not voices you would hear in a war or a place like that. And they decided to ignore it, but then it came back and it was even louder and it was from the trees, from the grass, from everything. Mm -hmm. And this time they decided to call in for you know an airstrike and able to bomb the place right. and then they did come and then after that the commander asked them why why did they ask for this and they couldn't answer him they just looked into his face and and that he couldn't understand why they did that and mm -hmm. what is the point of the story like why did you write it what was the reason for the silence well i mean with fiction writers there's never a one point there are a trillion not even points it's just things swirl together but i can say a few things about it one is, imagine you're out in the wilderness in Vietnam, and you're, uh, your mission is to not speak for seven days and just lie there on a listening post and listen. And imagine you're 19 years old or 18, and you're scared out of your mind, and you're staring into the black night after night after night after night, and you can't say anything. And imagine what's going to start happening in your head. Imagine if you just did that in your room. You're on campus and stare into the black and not speak. But it's not your room. This is Nam. Your imagination gears in. We had these things in uh, Vietnam. There, I don't know if they still have them. I guess they do. They were called starlight scopes. They were this, about this long. It was a machine that looked like kind of like a telescope. What it did was it took the orphan light around us, you know, the starlight and the moonlight, and it would rev it up. It would magnify the light somehow or another so that when you look through this thing, 
the night came alive. It was green. The night moved. Like the trees would kind of shimmy, and the the rice would be moving like this in the dark. Things that you never see in the dark because you can't see in the dark. But this thing you could. And that, there, so each of us had a kind of starlight scope inside of us where. The world becomes supernatural and spooky the same way if you're seven years old and you're lying in bed and you're looking at that closet door and you're imagining the boogeyman in there. And the boogeyman for us was real. It was the Viet Cong and the NVA soldiers. They were real. You knew they were real. And granted, you very rarely could see them, hardly ever, in fact. But through that imaginative thing, you're imagining things that are out there that you can't quite see. So you go back from an experience like this, much like coming to this college for me, and you try to talk about it, as I'm just trying to do right now. And there's a sense of giving up. I, I, I can't describe this for you. I'm, not, I'm just going to shut up and say nothing, because certain stories you just can't ever tell. That's the last line of that, that section of the book. They don't talk to that colonel because he's never been there, and he can't feel what you feel, which is how surreal the world becomes and how your imagination makes up goblins out there and sees spooks going through the dark. Um, and so you fall silent. That's another example of that silent motif that is, I've tried to thread through this talk. Some things you just can't talk about. Some stories you can't even tell. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for your talk. I really enjoyed it. So I You're appreciate welcome. you coming here today. Um, so I had a question for you. I had a friend um, who was in the Marines. He joined the Marines straight out of high school and was there for four years and fought in Afghanistan. And I met him in college after he, uh, he, he joined college, like right after he came back from the Marines. Um, and his life didn't turn out so well after that. He had major PTSD. Um, things just went downhill very quickly after a few months. And um, I was... My question to you is what someone like me just being a friend to this person could do being in that position because at the time I remember feeling very helpless because he was you know in a place where I couldn't relate to him at all mm -hmm. and I remember asking like you know go talk to someone who can help you go talk to a counselor or something but I feel like if he doesn't want to then he won't and I'm just wondering what what can we do because everything you said like in your talk really resonated with me like all the you know, I completely understand. I have no position. Yeah. I, I don't know at all. So I'm just wondering, what can we do? I mean, I, the answer to that, is, I'm sa sorry to say this, but the answer is not a lot. I hate to say it, but not a lot does not mean the same thing as nothing. There are two different things. By not a lot, I mean you, 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 you're not going to ever cure people. It's like curing people of life. How can you cure somebody who has been through combat or breast cancer or a concentration camp? How can you heal them in the kind of the standard sense of fixing a broken leg or, you know, mending? If, if you can't, the only way you can do it is, I guess, preventative medicine, like stop wars and then you'll cure it. On top of that, you have to bear in mind what a, veter a lot of veterans know, which is the, sort of the unspoken, dirty secret of it all which is that a many, a many of us don't want to be cured. We don't want to heal. At least if it means forgetfulness and erasing it all. I don't want to forget my life, and I don't want to forget my friends, and I don't want forget to forget the bad stuff I did. If that's what we mean by healing, I don't want any part of it. On top of that, there are certain things that, uh, that are best remembered that, that it, 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 soldiers do nasty things. And I described a couple in this talk, the old man at the well and the shooting of that buffalo. Well, I think I deserve some anxiety and some sleepless nights. 
and some insomnia. I think I've earned it by the nasty stuff I've done as part of serving our country, that kind of beautiful slogan. Um, and I think a good many veterans understand that, that, uh, that, 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 that this is not to say that we don't try to go on and get wives and children and lead our lives and be productive people. That we do try to do, but we don't do it at the expense of erasing our own failures of courage and our own failures of ethics. Uh, though the bad stuff we all do in our lives, not just soldiers. Um, I gave a talk to the, a whole bunch of psychiatrists in Washington, the scariest talk of my life. And this was pretty much my pitch. Um, and they agreed. Well, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I thought I was going to be very controversial. That it's not about erasing. I did say this. I said, you know, you guys are doctors. You went to med school. And if I came into your office and I had a cigarette in my hand, you would be duty-bound to tell me to stop smoking, wouldn't you? And they said, yeah. Why isn't it that these same doctors are not telling people, don't go to war? That's the only thing that's going to cure it. Just don't get sick. Stop going to war. Stop making wars. They don't do that. There was a little silent spell on that one. I mean, these are people paid by our government, so I guess it's, uh, I, shouldn't have, I should have kept my mouth shut. But there's a little truth in that that as medical people, that's the only solution to post-traumatic stress syndrome, is don't get it in the first place. Because what else do you expect? You send kids off to kill people, do you expect them not to have restless nights? You expect them not to drink? You expect them not to try to forget? Do you expect them not to think about killing themselves? Do you expect that? If you expect that, you're insane. Those are the consequences of, of wars. That's, what it's, that's the consequence. And uh, so that's, I don't know, what, what do you do? Well, you do, you listen to stories. That's the best you can do, I think. You listened to me today. I appreciated it. And uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, so obviously going to war has affected your writing style with the things they carry in, in the Lake of the Woods, which is one of my favorite books, by the way. But I was just wondering if before the war, like in college, you had planned on being a writer or if you had any ideas about what you wanted to write about, as well as some of your influences mm -hmm. in writing. I hadn't planned on being a writer, no. I wanted to be but they're two different things. I'd wanted to be a writer from the time I was probably nine years old. I had, uh, or eight, I'd written a little, alert. I'd, I'd this, there's an anecdote here, I gotta tell it, sorry. It's not, so anyway, I was, I was this rotten little league baseball player. Couldn't hit, couldn't field, couldn't run, couldn't throw. I was terrible. And I remember a day in, in, uh, in uh, I think like 1956, when I'd come off the baseball field after a particularly abysmal practice. I'd been striking out and booting ground balls. It was just a nightmare. And I realized for the first time I was not going to be a professional baseball player. So I'm trudging home and I passed the Nobles County Library, which is our town library. I went in there, I found this book. Still wearing my uniform and had my glove with me. And this book was called Larry of the Little League. That book is still out there, I've been told. And in this book, which I read in like half an hour, this kid Larry could do everything I couldn't do. He could field, hit, run, and throw. He was an incredible baseball player. Uh, I, put, I finished the book in a half an hour, and I went over to the library, and I asked for some paper and a pencil. And over the course of the next oh, 40 minutes, I wrote the first novel of my life. When you, that's when it was easy. You could do it in 40 minutes. Now it's like five years to write a novel. The title of which was Kimmy of the Little League. It was a direct ripoff of Larry. That is, and by ripoff, I mean I'd copy the paragraphs and stick my name in. Wherever the word Larry was, I'd put Timmy. And in the course of writing this book, the, 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 my character, the Timmy character, could do all the stuff he couldn't do in the real world. Uh, my little league team, which was the Kiwanis Little League team in Worthington, we won the Worthington 
playoffs, you know, the Little League Championship. I, I did it all. I played shortstop and first base simultaneously. I could catch it at short and throw it to first. I was pitcher, catcher. I got the game-winning hit. In the middle of the book, our team went up to the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, where we just beat up on this, on this rich, aristocratic school, uh, the town called Edina. Uh, we beat them like 100 to nothing. I scored all 100 runs. I did it all. And at the end of the book, our team went to the Little League World Series to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, where we defeated Taiwan, like 75,000 to nothing. I scored all 75,000 runs. And so the, the reason I tell you this anecdote was that was what, that, writing that, as, as weird as it sounds, that memory is as strong as anything from Vietnam. I mean, anything. I can picture that glove in my hand and how rotten I had felt at realizing I'd never be a professional baseball player and then discovering that through story, you can become that which you're not. You can go places you've never been. You can climb mountains. You can become a doctor, become, a nurse, become another gender. You can go down rabbit holes. You can go to Trafalgar, as Kurt Vonnegut. You can do anything through fiction. And that's why fiction exists. There's got to be a reason. Otherwise, there'd be no fiction, right? Everything would be nonfiction. I mean, why make anything up? There's got to be a reason. And it has to do with what could be but is not. You, you, you know, I, I could have walked away from the war in Vietnam. And in a novel, there's a character who does it, called Going After Cacciato. Fiction is also about that which maybe should have happened. And you can write about that. Or about what almost happened, but didn't. So those things were all in my head, I guess, and not that, not that abstract or that sophisticated, but they were in my head as a little kid writing that book with Timmy doing things he couldn't do. And for me as a writer, I recommend that to other veterans of wars, that you don't have to just write about what you experienced or what you felt. It's sometimes better to write about what you didn't experience, what you almost did but did not do, or to write about what you should have done and to make it happen in the pages and see what happens with the story. It is so easy, especially for veterans, but for anybody who's gone through traumatic stuff, to get locked into their own autobiographies, just locked into it. I gotta be faithful to everything that happened. When sometimes it's much more liberating to write about that which didn't happen, but could have. The example I give a lot is my, the death of my father recently, that when he died a couple of years back, and in, in the final you know, days and hours of his life. I could have gone to that hospital room. I could have taken my dad in my arms and said, Dad, I love you. I didn't do it. For a whole bunch of Midwestern father-son reasons, I stayed away from that room. And I certainly stayed away from the words, I love you. But in a story, miracles can happen. In a story, my dad can sit up from the dead. In a story, my dad can reach out and he can take me in his arms and say, that's okay. I know you love me. It didn't happen. It can't happen. The dead can't sit up and talk. But the fiction, the made-up stuff, does something that made me tear up just now in a way that the real story left me cold. Didn't go to the hospital and so on. So when, when the genesis of storytelling, for me at least, has to do with, with erasing reality. Sometimes you put it in. Some, if you don't want it, don't, don't put it in. I borrow from the real world, but I don't feel I have to be faithful to it. I feel I have to be faithful and said to something, that word I used early on in this talk, that my goal is to make people feel something, not to convince you and to harangue you, but through a story to make you feel something. And I think that's what a lot of, of veterans of wars 
would really want, would to make you feel something of what they'd gone through. Not to understand it, but to feel it. And that you can do through story. Great question. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. I grew up in a small town called Texarkana, Texas. And um, I had a high school teacher whose father had served in World War II under Patton. When the film came out, Patton, they took him to go see it. And the film began, and George C. Scott started giving the speech, and he got up and left. And so they went out to the audience and said, why didn't, why didn't you stay? He said, I, I had to listen to that son of a bitch too much. I don't want to listen to him anymore. <laughs> and so I'm curious. Vietnam has been on our cinema screens for 40 years. Yeah. I'm curious, since we're talking about after the war, and we're also talking about fiction, mm -hmm. um, if you can ha have some of your reflections about Vietnam and film and the power of it or how it's yeah. felt or that kind of thing. Well, I think like anything and any... Any, any social phenomenon, war or you know, uh, recession or whatever, there's going to be good stuff and bad stuff that's going to come out. And the same with Vietnam. There's some of the most horrible movies ever made came out of Vietnam. One was called The Boys in Company C. You ought to see it to see what... what this is like Hitler made this movie, only a, a dumb Hitler, like a Hitler without any brains. I mean, it's just awful. It's, it's the worst movie ever made. I mean, I can't describe how bad it is. And then there are great, strange, weird movies that I think are beautiful and will last forever, one of which is Apocalypse Now. That uh, it, the movie hypnotizes me. It makes me feel as close to being back in Vietnam as I can get without being in my dreams. In my dreams, I'm back. But in this movie, with the absurdities of it all and that... that uh, the craziness of it all, that, 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 that was Vietnam for me. Um, like Madman Marlon Brando and, you know, the Killer Martin Sheen and the, that journey up this Heart of Darkness river. It felt, it felt like Nam to me. And I thought it was a beautifully made movie. And it, but more than that, I felt that it, it, it captured a through its music and through its story and through the great acting and the good writing of the piece captured Vietnam. The, uh, the, 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 the story was written by a really great writer named Michael Hurd. The movie was written by him. He wrote a book called Dispatches, one of the great books to come out of Vietnam. Uh, he, he, Michael has a capacity to capture the, that rock and roll lingo that was Nam, that rock and roll way of talking, and that movie does it. Another movie I thought was wonderful was The Deer Hunter. A lot of veterans hated it, but I thought The Deer Hunter, it's, uh, for those who haven't seen it, there's, there are scenes in which Russian roulette is being played. Well, bullets put in a pistol, and these captured soldiers, American soldiers, are made to put the gun to their heads and pull the trigger as a kind of torture. Well, veterans complain, well, that never happened, and it didn't. I mean, as far as I know, but it shows you the power of metaphor because when I'm watching those scenes, that is what combat felt like. It felt like gun to my head and my muscles all tense up and I can feel this tension in my fingers and then click, I'm alive. That's what combat felt like. It didn't feel like John Wayne movies and all the common stuff you think. It didn't feel at all like that, but it felt like this thing that never happened and then you do it again, and you got to do it again, and again the next day or the next hour, and you do it for a whole year. Click, I'm alive. And you feel that, you got to pull that trigger to do that. That's what it feels like. And the analog is every day you got to get up and you got to start humping. You don't want to. You want to lie on the ground and never move another muscle and let some helicopter come down and take you away to Japan. But instead, your body gets up and your legs start moving and you move off toward the first village of the day, the first mountain, the first rice paddy, cross that first river. Your body does what it doesn't want to do, just like you don't want to pull that trigger. So that's an example of a movie that I thought was really, at least in parts, really, really moving. So it's kind of hit and miss, but the really good ones are totally beautiful. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, maybe one or two more. Okay, five more minutes. Okay, yes, sir. Okay. Hello, my name is Armando Villegas. I'm from uh, Dos Pueblos High School, and one of the questions I'd like to ask you is, how did you adapt to um, your society after um, the war? Like, how did you cope? Well, I, I, I didn't, in a way. And 
Um, there are two things I can say. One is I remember I said I took that uniform off and put on the clothes I've got on. Right now, I haven't changed my costume except they're new clothes, but they're the same thing. Sweater, jeans, and a hat. And I've done it now for 45 years. The reason I did it was I didn't want to walk around having people ask me about Vietnam. I wanted a life, and I wanted a, the quietude of privacy and all that sort of thing. Uh, so I coped through not, not telling people I was a veteran or had even been in, uh, in a war. However, I had another way of coping, which was that I didn't stay, although in my personal life I stayed silent, I'd, I was writing, even in Vietnam. Uh, at the end of a day's march, I would, there's a kind of an 45 minutes when you, you go to the top of a hill and you dig foxholes and you sit around waiting for dark to come. And most guys would horse around and, you know, do pranks and talk. And I would sometimes write little vignettes about what had happened that day. Um, they would only be a page long or two pages, and I'd put them in my rucksack. And over the course of a tour in Vietnam, I probably accumulated like 30 or 40 pages of handwritten stuff. And then after returning from the war, I kept writing privately, not a lot, but a little here and a little there. But I did it with regularity. I didn't skip days. I just kept doing a little bit. Um, with the, Not even the thought originally of writing a book. It became a book, but I didn't think that. I just thought I'm, I'm writing, trying to not put the people on the page, but to put my heart on the page, the, the stuff that was hurting me inside on the page through story, just through story. And uh, that gradually became a writer. So I had this vent or this outlet that other veterans don't have, who don't write. I wish they had it. It would really help them a lot. But I had it naturally from this desire as a kid with Larry the Little League. I, I, was, I, was, I wanted to be a writer, and now I was just doing it without even really thinking about it. I'm doing it. I was just doing it. Um, so that, those two things together, I was kind of silence in a personal way with this writing thing going on simultaneously is how I managed to make my way through it. However, I'm not, it's, I'm not recuperated any, and I never will be, nor will anybody else who's been in a war. It's like asking somebody who had breast cancer, you know, are you all, are you all well? My sister wakes up every day wondering, is it going to be a recurrence, going to be a recurrence? You, you're never well, and, and in some ways you shouldn't be. It's like uh, having an unhappy childhood. I don't think you can recover from it. You can cope, but you don't recover in the standard sense. Maybe one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, in the middle of all the horrors, was there ever any slight moment of hope? Any what? Slight moment of hope. Well, yeah, there was constant hope. That that's what kept us going. I suppose that's the same thing that with through life itself. We all know the end of the story of our lives. We're all going to die. We know how the story ends, and it's the same ending for all of us. But we don't go through life with every second thinking, I think I'll skip the lobster tail tonight. I'm going to die. And I, I, I think I won't have that gin and tonic because like, I'm going to die. And I don't think I'll fall in love because I'm going to die. You don't live your life. Human beings have a capacity both to know our, the inevitable outcome of things unlike the chipmunks, let's say, or the gophers. But we also have the capacity, unlike the chipmunks and the gophers, to deal with the, the, uh, the realities of what we know about um, our futures. And we find hope in the midst of hopelessness. Great, great books have been written, especially coming out of the Holocaust, Man's Search for Meaning and the stories of Primo Levi about that, about how in the midst of the great savagery and brutality, um, hope um, keeps, keeps us going. And not just hope, but also joy. In the midst of horror, 
you take great joy in stuff that you don't that's you wouldn't expect. You, you lie in ambush on a night, scared out of your mind, but you hear the wind and you see the moon. You can hear your boots slashing in the patties, and you take an immense pleasure in in your aliveness in the midst of all this horror. You value stuff you never knew you valued. The Minnesota Vikings and a McDonald's hamburger. Nothing, I mean, you can talk about how horrible they are, but try eating pork and beans out of a can for a year and you're going to want a Big Mac. And your mom and dad and your hometown, so you appreciate and value things you never knew you appreciated. And all those go into this hope thing that is part of the uh, contradictory experience of, of war. There's the savagery and the brutality on this hand, and there's the recognition of all that's valuable and what might be lost in the next instant with your own death. And they live side by side inside of you, and it's part of what makes this uh, experience of combat so surreal and hard to articulate. Um, it's part of what causes nostalgia on the part of so many veterans. 20 years later, 40 years later, these pot-bellied guys walking down Main Street, draped in their flags. Well, they're not being nostalgic for the violence. They're being nostalgic for something else, which is the stuff I just talked about, the things they learned about themselves and what's valuable in this world. Okay, I want to say th thank you to the school for having me, and thank you for your great questions. I've had a good time. Thank you.